Welcome to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here, coming to you live and direct on the Think Tech from Kailua, Hawaii. And uh, hope everybody's doing well, staying healthy, um, staying sane after all the stuff that's been going on the last couple of weeks. And uh, keeping your head on your shoulders. But today's show is a, a little bit different. I was telling the production folks that... Um, this is kind of a sister show to a show I did back in October of 2016. Actually, it was on October 14th, 2016, where I talked about critical analysis and why critical analysis was so important before we made big decisions about energy storage and things like that. That, you know, things like batteries and, and hydrogen and, and um, pumped hydro and things like that, you couldn't just go energy in, energy out, decision made. You actually have to look at where the products materials come from, you know, where, where, where are those uh, located? Who owns those? What countries own them? Are they in short supply? Are they hazardous? Um, you know, are they dangerous? Um, does the technology cause any other problems like fires and things like that? And I was pointing out in that video that, you know, we, we tend not to do a lot of critical thinking nowadays. And I, I attribute that to the fact that information is so available um, with Wikipedia and Google and you can do a search here you can get a GPS location and just get your way there um, we just become so used to quickly finding information that we don't bother in many cases to do in-depth studying and the bad side of that is then you can easily manipulate people because you can give them just part of the truth or part of the story and deceive them that it's actually a good decision and that that happens a lot, a lot more than most people realize nowadays. Um, but the sister topic of that is the one I'm going to talk about today, which is risk management and risk assessment. And to start off with, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, why um, that's a kind of a focus of mine. Uh, you notice in the background, I have a couple of airplanes on pedestals and stuff. They're airplanes that I flew in the military. And in the military, um, we used to say, in the Air Force, safety first. And after a couple of years, people started talking about that in terms of a, a mantra and saying, well, if safety's first, then we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't be in combat and we shouldn't do this. And we, because none of that's safe. And if safety is first, then we can't do our mission. We, we can't fly airplanes because flying airplanes isn't safe. And flying airplanes in combat certainly isn't safe. So is it really safety first? And so our Air Force safety folks really, and they're awesome people, they do incredible work. They started training us on risk management, risk analysis, risk management, uh, and how that fit into our routine. So let me kind of give you an, a picture of what it's like in a, like a fighter squadron when you're doing everything from scheduling crews to putting missions up to going to combat, what you think of as a leader in one of those organizations, and you're trying to handle risk. In other words, you know what you're gonna do is dangerous, but how do you minimize the danger? How do you minimize the risk? And then at the end of the show, we'll talk about how that dovetails in to energy and why it seems like sometimes we can't get the good parts of energy online fast enough or, or you know, brought about and, and get over that hump. And a lot of it has to do with risk avoidance. In other words, people don't want to do risk analysis, so they don't know how. So they just avoid the subject altogether and just kick the can down the road. So in the military, if you were in a flying squadron, um, the first level of risk assessment or risk analysis is done by the scheduler. Um, the scheduler would sit down and say, okay, how many airplanes do I have? Uh, who needs what kind of training? And he starts putting a schedule together. He starts building the schedule and he tries to make all of the training fit the number of airplanes he has and the number of sorties that the pilots need, who's, who needs the currency the, the soonest because they're going to run out of currency in landings or something. So he does the kind of the mechanics. And he's the first level of risk analysis because he, what he's trying to do is not take somebody who hasn't been flying for a long time and turn around and stuff them into a really complex mission to get a whole bunch of their training done 
and and oversaturate him and put him into a situation where he he could get overwhelmed kind of balances the training that needs to be done with the time that's available and the missions that are available to do for that week because sometimes you're doing air to air sometimes you're doing air to ground sometimes you're doing um, uh, navigation missions sometimes you're doing instrument training sometimes you're doing night flying sometimes you're doing refueling and how does that all fit together so the scheduler actually has the first crack at risk analysis and trying to make the right crew members fit in the right spot on the schedule way above the scheduler is the ops officer or the squadron commander but usually the ops officer because he's a more hands-on guy now what he's looking at is he's looking at the schedule and going well wait a minute you know, Captain So-and-so, he, he just came off of being uh, down for a flu virus. And so he's still got some medical side effects and maybe even taking medication. Uh, I don't know if I want him doing that sortie. Uh, and so the ops officer is looking at, at things like that from a big picture. Or he may know that a certain aviator has financial issues that the rest of the squadron doesn't know anything about because it's kind of confidential or maybe having personal problems or things like that, where the ops officer and the commander might be aware of this stuff, but the rest of the people running the squadron don't. And so they, they look at the schedule and they look and they see, hey, are we really doing the right thing by having this particular aviator doing that particular mission? Or are we, over, are we gonna oversaturate him and maybe bring him into an unsafe situation? And in between those two individuals, you have what we call the SOF or the supervisor of flying. Now, that guy, he's kind of what we put at the tactical level. He's the one that's taking the schedule and getting the crews together and executing it. But he starts to bring in factors like, what's the weather like? Have they shut down the primary runway on the base? And we've got formation takeoff schedule, but the secondary runway is not wide enough for formation takeoffs. You know, he starts dealing with the nuts and bolts of what's going on on the ground and what he's got to deal with to make sure that we can fly safely. You know, he looks at the, the, the weather in particular and says, wait a minute, I've got two young guys flying this instrument sortie and it's no joke, really instrument conditions, you know, and I need, I probably should have an instructor in that flight and not just two young, uh, you know, basic level, uh, entry level fighter pilots or whatever. So he'll sit there and he may actually adjust the schedule or change cockpits or change missions a little bit after coordinating with the scheduler and the ops officer to make sure that he's taking the, the real what's, on, what's happening on the ground in the air with the weather and some other things like that and fitting it in there. So maybe all of a sudden the wind comes up and your sea state's so high that it, it gets dangerous to fly, period. And he might even have to cancel some of the flying because it's just not safe. You've entered something not safe. So the military's done a really good job, especially the aviation community, in doing what we call risk analysis. And the unfortunate thing is risk analysis takes time and it takes really trained people that are looking for the full spectrum of things that could impact those flyers and what they're doing. The weather, their, their personal lives, their medication, their, their uh, mental state, their Currency and flying. Have they not been flying? Did they just come back from combat operations? Um, one of the things I'll tell you when I was flying in a crew airplane is actually counterintuitive, but but for me, it played a big part in my risk analysis was do I have two instructors or three instructors on the flight deck? You would think that that would make it a really safe, safe flight if you have three highly qualified instructor evaluators on the flight deck. I think if you looked at flying history, you'd find that that's the most dangerous combination of people on a flight deck because they all know what they're doing and nobody questions the other person when they're doing something that doesn't look right. And I remember a Korean Airlines flight that landed in, in San Francisco with a highly experienced crew on board and they let a very experienced pilot fly the airplane right into the ground short of the runway and they were lucky they didn't have more fatalities in that flight and that's the scenario. You're, you're better off with an experienced instructor and a really inexperienced co-pilot or a brand new co-pilot and another pretty experienced but not an instructor or just maybe a brand new instructor in the co-pilot seat. You know, it, you really have to watch it. It doesn't necessarily mean that the most experienced person is the best person there. 
So the, the Air Force and the, and the military aviation community in general has done a really great job of risk analysis. But we in the civilian world, in the business world, in the political world, in, in the energy world, we don't, we're not so good at it. And the reason is it's too easy to just defer it and say, oh, but it's too risky. We're not doing it. It's too risky. My investors won't go for it. It's too risky. You know, maybe we're just going to stick with our current technology. So how does that um, come down in, um, say, a company? Uh, you have a company, they're really, they're really comfortable in, in the business that they do. They've got a track record. Um, they've had steady growth in their whole history. But a new technology comes along and they're, they're saying, no, well, you know, our, we've always had a track record. This is good. You know, we've, we've got a history. We've got, we've got proof that our, our business model works. Well, think of the Bell Telephone Company. Um, think of what happened when cell phones hit and everybody started dumping their landlines on their home phones because of cell phones. Uh, you can't just get comfortable as a business with what you're comfortable with or what, what's made you successful. In the military, we say you, you, don't, you can't build your future fighting the last war. You can't use the same weapons and the same tactics and the same everything because guess what? Your enemy's read your history books and, and watched you and, and now analyzed your, your tactics and things. So at the very least, your enemy's up to speed on how you usually do it. You need to be ready for the next war. And that's true for businesses too. They have to be ready for the future. They have to plan for the future. They have to look at the future. One of my personal projects when I worked for the state in the energy side was trying to get Hawaii Gas, uh, our local gas utility, that has PUC regulations because they they run gas lines across tax map keys and and they're basically regulated to to make sure they treat the the population fairly and pricing fair and everything. And I I had a hard time convincing them. In fact, I'm not sure they're totally convinced at the higher levels that the next natural gas replacement is hydrogen. And a bunch of their engineers that understand hydrogen and understand that technology, they get it. They're all over it. They're, they're telling me, Stan, we, we understand this, but you know, but the shareholders, that's who the leadership reports to, and they're not quite there yet. So we're just going to have to take our time and keep plugging away. So at the company level, you have risk management that's driven by shareholders. You have risk analysis that's, that's pretty short-sighted. It's like, yeah, you're taking care of your current shareholders, but when the bottom drops out of your industry, and suddenly you find yourself chasing the guy who has the latest technology, your shareholders won't be really happy. So you better start doing some, some risk analysis, start looking at new technologies and try and project out in the future and plan your future if you're running a company. So, but it's not just, it's not just companies. Um, there's people on the other side, venture capitalists. You know, we're, we're big into a new industry um, and high tech um, transition here in a lot, of, a lot of different industries. I mean, I can't think of an industry that's not impacted by high tech at this point. Even agriculture, farmers are using GPS in their, in their um, tractors and their combines. They're using computers to analyze their soil moisture and programming which way their their irrigation systems do most of the the hydrating of their fields and when they do it and you know throwing in weather analysis to, to make sure they do it at the right time and time of day and things like that um, and if you don't if you don't do that stuff if you don't take that into account as part of your risk analysis you know what's going to make me succeed in the future you fall behind really really quickly but venture capitalists they're the people that work on these startup companies, these tech companies. You know, they can't afford to be risk averse. They have to sit there and they really, that's why usually have venture capitalists look at companies that are emerging and they really go and tear the business plan apart and try and bring in new technology um, questions and, uh, and looking. And so I'd say venture capitalists that, that help tech companies and help new businesses are probably some of the most adept at doing risk analysis because 
their new investors uh, will lose confidence in them rapidly if they take uh, too much risk and or don't look at things well enough to recognize real good technology because they didn't do decent uh, and not critical analysis. As I go back to that October 2016 show, the critical analysis with venture capitalists. Then you have another sector that really, I don't think people realize how much is driven by the insurance sector. It's really, really big. And if there's one word that can be associated with insurance directly, it's risk. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick break here. And when we come back from the break, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the insurance companies that, that help us uh, stay legal driving our cars and, and pretty much every professional has an insurance policy to protect them from being sued. And we'll talk about that after the break. Aloha, I'm John David Ann, the host of History Lens on Think Tech Hawaii. History Lens deals with contemporary events and looks at them through a historical perspective or what we call a history lens. Uh, the show is streamed live on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha. Welcome back to Stan, the energy man, Stan Osterman here. And we're talking risk. And we, we before the break, we talked about insurance companies. And if anybody does risk analysis in industry really, really well, it's an insurance company. Insurance companies look at all kinds of risk. They, they look at the particular um, professional risk that certain, you know, um, contractors or companies have to take on. But a big chunk of the risk that seems to um, occupy their time and their financial concern is what we would call liability or tort risk, where people like doctors or other professionals who would get sued um, for malpractice or not doing a professional job at whatever they're doing, accounting or whatever, can be taken to civil court um, and sued. And those insurance companies have to do a risk analysis on that. So if you really want to get into studying, you know, risk analysis on a corporate level, look at an insurance company. And let's look at some of their customers, like doctors, for example. How does risk start to drive things like medical costs? Well, if the courts are taking civil cases where a doctor makes a mistake and causes harm to a patient, and then the patient comes back and sues that doctor in civil court, and then the courts award $1 million, $2 million, $10 million for damages um, and punitive damages and, and, and other damages, um, the insurance company usually pays a big bulk of that, or sometimes the insurance company will go to court against the doctor and try and contest the fact so they don't have to pay that much of it and leave more of the burden on the doctor. Well, if you can imagine, um, that kind of insurance for malpractice gets pretty pricey, um, depend, especially depending on what kind of, of um, surgeon or doctor you are. You can actually have so much liability out there and so much risk that it, it's hard to get medical insurance coverage for you. And when you do, it's really expensive. So like every other product, um, when there's an expensive piece to it that's that's got to be paid and is part of the basic cost of uh, doing business, it gets passed on to the consumer. That means it gets passed on to the patients who have to put the bill for their medical care or the insurance companies that put the bill for the medical care. Now, that's, that's not just for um, medical malpractice, so to, so, so to speak, but also the fact that when you have a doctor that 
say he, he's got a pretty good idea of what's wrong with you. And so he wants to prescribe a few things and does a few tests. But he eliminates a couple tests because he's, he's pretty certain that's not a factor. Well, there's people that sue doctors because they didn't do tests. So the standard practice now in a lot of, of medical professions is I got to give you every test, even though I don't think you need the test, or I, I got to give you every drug, be, even though I don't think you need the drug, because if I don't, I'm going to get sued for not having you try it. And that also is just crazy in terms of risk analysis. So our, our legal system and our tort system, I think needs a little bit reform on the medical side because risk analysis is obviously missing from some of the, the, um, the logic in how we do medical care. Um, finally, because I want to kind of wrap this thing into the energy side is politicians. Um, I've noticed fairly recently, and I talked about it in the October 2016 show, um, one of the most risk averse um, career fields in the world is politics. Um, you've got politicians who just look at polls and they'll be conservative one day and liberal the next day based on a poll of, uh, you know, or a couple of polls that say he should be one way or the other. And that's a hell of a way to run a career and, and you know, run governance or do leadership is to sit there and flip flop on issues based on polls, not actual facts or data or st statistics or morals or anything, but you're just trying to please your constituency and get votes uh, or please the people that uh, contribute to your campaigns. Um, and, and that's where we run into a lot of trouble. And therefore you dovetail in the energy piece, which is the crux of what I wanted to talk about today. And I'll wrap it up with that. You know, we're in, an, in a world where we're talking climate change and carbon reduction and um, getting rid of fossil fuels and things like that. And if you watch my show at all, you know, I'm all about that. I'm all about cleaning up our internal combustion engines in our cars and cleaning up our grid and the pollution, especially here in Hawaii that we generate burning fossil fuels for electricity. I'm all about, you know, solar and wind and even the good old fashioned hydroelectric. I mean, we have, we have hydroelectric sources on, in our state that are untapped. We used to have, have flumes that, that moved water all over this island for sugarcane and pineapple. And we should be using those for hydroelectric power, and we don't. But why? The reason is our politicians are risk averse. They look at what's going on in the world or their community right then, and if it conflicts with what we should be doing long-term strategically and well thought out and well planned and well risk analyzed, um, we'd be focusing on cleaning up our energy. If we, if we focused on our economy in Hawaii, we would be focusing on energy, not all the other garbage that seems to be important to you know, people today. And why do I say that? I don't know an economist in the state that would look at the amount of money that the state of Hawaii spends on fossil fuels for transportation and for electrical generation. And if you, if you told that economist, we're gonna get rid of all of that bill, that entire expenditure, and we're gonna be self-sustaining. We're going to not buy energy from anybody else. We're gonna take the energy generation we have from geothermal and from solar and from wind and from hydroelectric and from any other number of sources, wave motion, ocean, thermal, whatever. And we can produce, and I've talked to a lot of professionals around the state, we can produce about eight times the electricity that we need in the state and, and transportation electricity included if we're all electric vehicles from our natural resources here in the state. And if we did that, we could actually have a completely robust economy that didn't depend on just a couple markets to keep us afloat. So let me give you a current example of that. We used to, as I said, have sugarcane and pineapple as part of our agricultural backbone of our economy. And the three legs of this economic stool in Hawaii has always been agriculture and tourism and the military. 
because the military has a big presence here. The military brings in a lot of federal funding and a lot of um, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, Coast Guardsmen that spend a lot of money in our stores and buy cars here and things like that. Um, so the military is a big chunk. The military is the biggest uh, customer of Hawaiian Electric. So the military is really important here. Um, but so is tourism. Tourism creates a whole lot of jobs in Waikiki, whether it's housekeeping or cooking and um, tour, tour guides and tour buses. And, you know, it's huge. But we lost agriculture. We don't grow much pineapple or sugar cane anymore. We have a couple of notional fields up in, uh, in Kunia uh, where we have pineapples for the tourists. It's, it's basically to, to give pineapples to the local market here and to have pineapples to show tourists what we used to have in Hawaii in terms of a, a big agriculture. So we're down to military and tourism. Well, what's happened to us with the COVID-19 is we've had no tourism since early March. We quarantined uh, our local inner island travel up until this week, where you had to, if you traveled inner island to another island, you couldn't leave your hotel room or your residence for 14 days. That's lifted as of yesterday or day before yesterday. And now we still have a quarantine for tourists coming in. And we've arrested a whole boatload of tourists who have violated their quarantine and turned them into felons or at least uh, lawbreakers, um, find them and even sent them home because they couldn't stay in their hotel room for 14 days after spending a bunch of money to get here. Um, even our local bed and breakfast folks are getting slammed for uh, not quarantining people that come in as tourists. So two legs of our stool are pretty darn either non-existent anymore or so fragile that the next pandemic or the next, the next thing that stops our tourism, whether it's high oil prices or whatever, is going to cripple two of the three legs of our, our economy already. And all we have left is the military. And that's really scary for the people that live here and have to survive. So why is it that getting our environment and our energy sector self-sufficient like as soon as you can why isn't that a priority it's because politicians are risk averse politicians don't focus on the long-term big issues um, they look at what's going to get them a vote this week or next week they're notorious for kicking the can down the road and worrying about it later they talk a great story. Everybody was poo-pooing President Trump for backing out of the Paris Climate Accord. Every single one of our mayors and our governor said, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to go full steam ahead. I don't see a whole lot. I mean, not a whole lot of actual work being done, of actual things being done um, to, to eliminate our fossil fuels. Even Hawaiian Electric, they still, they're doing battery testing. They're doing... They're trying to put some more solar panels up here and there, but they can't take a whole lot more intermittent renewables on their grid. It's too unstable. So when we talk about risk and we talk about risk analysis and risk being risk averse, we can't get new technology out if the venture capitalists don't want to put the money in there because they don't trust the technology. We can't put new technology and better energy solutions out if the politicians are so risk averse and can't do good risk analysis to do strategic planning and give them a better picture of how they could improve a bigger picture if they would do full risk analysis. We can't go anywhere <clears throat> if we keep a narrow band on our view of how we view risk. Even the fact that the, the quarantining or the, the stay at home orders that were issued by governors and, and professed by the CDC they were totally medically driven, but not economically driven. And it wasn't too long before we saw the economic impact, but there were, there were economists that would have told you the economics of shutting everybody off and tell, tell them to stay home is gonna be devastating. Well, it took the politicians two or three weeks to figure that one out. That's the kind of short-sighted risk analysis we do nowadays. We can't afford to do that with energy. We need to put the energy pieces together that are gonna keep us going clean up our environment, get rid of carbon-based fuels and, and CO2, we need to do it sooner rather than later. And if we don't do good risk analysis, we're going to do a poor job at that. So I think that's about it for risk analysis and energy today. Uh, thanks for listening to uh, my thoughts on it. Um, 
been around the world for 66 years and learn an awful lot and just trying to share it with you. So until next week, this is Dan Energy Man, signing off. Aloha.